everybody, it's Jay Roe. we got a new series we're going to be doing once in a while of uh, Legends of Chess. And the first one that I'm going to do is going to focus on a gentleman by the name of Boris Gulko. And um, if you haven't heard of his name before, um, don't feel too bad because I didn't know about him either until uh, fairly recently. Um, but this man has an amazing characteristic to him, at least in terms of chess, in that he is one of the very few people in the entire world who holds a positive score against Garry Kasparov. Now, Garry Kasparov is one of the greatest chess champions of all time, and uh, some of his fans have even made the case that he is the strongest chess player um, in recorded history. Um, now, there's always arguments for and against that, um, but this man, Boris Golko, um, had a positive score against him. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, you know, maybe he fluked off a win. Well, not really. This guy has actually faced Kasparov eight separate occasions uh, from the years 1978 to 2001, and he has a plus score against Kasparov. He's actually defeated Kasparov three times. He has lost once, and he's drawn the other four. So he has a three and one record against Kasparov with four draws, which is amazing. Now, some other skeptics out there might be thinking to themselves, well, you know, maybe he got his wins off when Kasparov was, was really young and, and fresh and getting onto the scene. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is he beat Kasparov in 1981, he beat Kasparov in 1990, and he beat Kasparov in 1995. And in fact, they played again in 2001 uh, in a rapid tournament, and they drew uh, in that one. So he's actually faced Kasparov um, on a number of occasions throughout uh, Kasparov's uh, brilliant chess career and came up with a, a positive score. So when I first heard about this, I, I had to look into it and I had to find out about this gentleman and his story, his life story is unbelievable and that is one of the reasons why I want to make this uh, my first Legends of Chess video uh, focused on Boris Golko because the story behind this man, um, chess aside, is, is extraordinarily interesting. Um, he was born in 1947, uh, he was born in Germany and played uh, chess in Russia for a number of years. Um, in fact, he won the Russian uh, chess championship in 1977. So he was a USSR uh, chess champion back in 1977. And then, you know, what had happened, in a twist of fate, um, he was kind of against the communist regime along with his wife. And uh, he was actually barred from playing uh, competitive chess for a period of time. Um, and in fact, he was actually even beaten by KGB agents on an occasion. And, um, it, you know, so his chess career started out in a brilliant fashion. But due to the politics of the day, um, he was held back from playing competitive chess for a long time, actually. Um, so finally, he immigrated to the United States in 1986, and he went on to win the U.S. Chess Championship. Um, so he is the only person in history uh, to hold both uh, the Russian Championship of Chess uh, along with the U.S. Chess Championship title. And um, there's more to the man that is very interesting, but I'm going to focus more on the chess now, and we're going to take a look at a game that he played against Kasparov and defeated Kasparov um, with the black pieces. So not only has he beaten Kasparov two times with the white pieces, uh, but he also beat Kasparov uh, once with the black pieces. And this game took place in 1982 and uh, took place in Russia. And uh, the lines of the Queen's Gambit had accepted classical main line. So I'm going to flip back to the beginning of the game. This is the position where Kasparov actually resigned. So let's get back to the start of the game. So Kasparov's playing white, uh, Golko's playing black, and Kasparov opens up with the Queen's Pawn opening. And Golko replies pawn to d5, and Kasparov now uh, offers up the Gambit Pawn. Now in this position, Golko goes ahead and accepts. Uh, Kasparov plays pawn now to e3, and uh, Golko develops the knight now to f6. Kasparov can now come down and capture that pawn, uh, so material is equalized. And from here, Goko just plays the pawn up now to e6, and that's opening up access for the dark square bishop, giving that uh, piece more options. And from here, Kasparov now develops the knight now to uh, f3. And from this position, Goko plays now pawn up to c5. And uh, Kasparov can't really come in and capture this pawn simply because that would allow uh, Goko to come in, crash into the position, and capture the queen on uh, d1. And uh, that would force uh, Kasparov to capture back with the king, and he wouldn't be able to castle for the remainder of the game. Um, so instead, uh, Kasparov decides to castle in this position. And Goko now plays pawn up to a6, taking away the uh, b5 square away from Kasparov's bishop. Now, Kasparov plays in this position pawn to e5. 
and uh, Goko replies pawn now to b5 attacking the bishop. I'm going to take a moment and go back one move though. You might be wondering why uh, Goko just doesn't come in and take this pawn because it looks like it's free for the taking. Um, but in reality if Goko comes in and captures the pawn, Kasparov has the move queen to e2 and uh, this leads to a, a fairly good position for white uh, once all the moves are played out. So for example a common reply from black in this position is just to bring the knight back down to f6 uh, but white now has the pawn move to d5 and um, depending on what follows um, it's a it's a slight favorable position for white so it definitely would have been in uh, Kasparov's uh, favor to uh, have Goko capture that pawn uh, but instead of taking that pawn uh, Goko decides at the time now to uh, play pawn up to b5 attacking the light square bishop and Kasparov now retreats it uh, to d3 now from this position Goko places bishop up to b7 giving it access along this diagonal carving down into the center of the board and Kasparov now in turn brings his bishop down pinning that knight to the queen so at least for the short term that knight is not going anywhere um, but from here Goko actually decides to capture the pawn on d4 and Kasparov tries to uh, bait his opponent with a nice little take here he captures with the knight on d4 now the knight is currently unprotected uh, but if Goko were to come down and capture the knight uh, Kasparov has a great tactic in that he can just come down now, deliver check with the bishop, and once the bishop is captured, um, Kasparov can just come down and capture that queen, and that would be a move that would pretty much win the game. So Goko wasn't going to do that by any stretch of the imagination. But if we even go back to, to move 9, uh, before the knight captures the pawn, uh, you might have noticed that uh, Kasparov had another option to move as well, and that would have been to bring the pawn down and try to exploit this pin knight. Well, while that might sound good on the surface, um, it doesn't work out very well in, in practice because black simply has pawn to h6. And it doesn't matter if white captures the knight with his bishop or retreats the bishop uh, to h4, black is going to be ahead positionally um, regardless of which uh, option white takes. Um, so Kasparov probably saw that and realized that and decided that uh, trying to take advantage of that pin knight in that particular position wasn't good. So instead Kasparov took with the knight, um, hoping to get that uh, queen to capture here, um, but uh, Goko simply played from this position knight to d7. So now all of a sudden this whole tactic of the bishop coming down to deliver check to an exposed queen is no longer there. So from here now Kasparov develops his last minor piece to c3 and Goko now brings his knight up to e5. And at this point in the game um, Kasparov made a questionable move and in that he actually sacked a piece here um, or tried to sack a piece actually would be a better uh, way to put it. Kasparov came down and attacked the uh, pawn on b5 so he sacked the knight in effect. Now as to exactly what he was planning if that sack actually went through uh, it's not sure because even though it leads to kind of a wild position, if black takes and actually captures the knight on b5, um, after all the moves are played through, um, it's actually, you know, there's no clear advantage for white at all. In fact, there might even be a slight positional advantage for black. Um, but Goko actually didn't even have to accept that uh, sacrifice at all. In fact, Goko just came in and captured on d3 and um, completely ignored the knight on uh, b5 because this knight currently isn't really doing much. So from this position now, Kasparov actually comes down and captures that knight with his queen. And that allows Goko now to just come in and capture the knight on b5. And from here, Kasparov plays rook over to d1. And uh, Goko now just simply develops the bishop now to e7, basically breaking the pin that was uh, being exerted on that knight by that bishop. And from here, Kasparov now comes in and captures that pawn with check. Uh, but Goko simply has to play queen up to d7 to block now because there's not really anything major being threatened. Uh, from here now, Kasparov brings the queen back to b3. And this allows Goko now to come in and take that pawn on e4. Uh, Kasparov now brings the knight over to uh, f5 in an interesting move. And while it does open up an attack on the queen from the rook, all Gulko has to do in this position is simply play bishop over to uh, a d5. And that threat's all taken care of. And now all of a sudden Kasparov's queen is under attack. So he needs to do something quick because he's already down a couple pawns. So Kasparov comes in and delivers a check with his knight. And uh, Gulko just simply moves the king over to f7. And from here Kasparov now swings the queen over to h3. Uh, but that's easily blocked by pawn to h5. 
5. And now Kasparov's options are becoming more limited. So he moves his queen over to uh, g3, and now Gokul can come in and safely take that knight. Uh, because once uh, Kasparov comes in and captures with the bishop, uh, putting him in check, he can simply capture the bishop now uh, with his king. And Kasparov doesn't really have any immediate threats. So from here, Kasparov brings his rook down in an attempt to uh, you know, come up with some kind of coordinated attack. But now all Gukul has to do is play the bishop up to d6, and Kasparov has nothing. This pawn is protecting this square here on g4, and these bishops are protecting these diagonals. More importantly, Kasparov's queen is under attack, and now this rook is, is looking pretty much useless. So Kasparov peels his queen back, Gukul moves his king now to g6, and once Kasparov plays pawn up to h3 and Gukul plays bishop to c7, uh, Kasparov resigns. He's down too much material, his attack has totally been stopped, and there's no hope up against the bishop pair in this position. So I hope you found the video interesting. I definitely found looking up information on Boris Gokul very fascinating, and I definitely consider him to be a legend of chess. So take care, hope you enjoy the video, and we'll see you next time.